Uh, I mean, I just start off by saying that whatever you saw in terms of that video right before this presentation started is not the kind of games we make. Um, for, for people around here who know our business, games 24-7, uh, we run a skill gaming plat you know, business. We, we do actually have a casual game studio, and uh, I'll definitely talk a little bit about that uh, through this presentation. <coughs> to start, you know, when, when Neha came and told me, Neha and Saurabh in our team, about uh, me talking about the future of gaming experience, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big student of neuroscience, and interestingly, as it turns out, uh, the parts of our brain that light up or that go to work when you're thinking about the future are also the same parts of the brain that go to work and light up when you're thinking about the past. And so that, that naturally took me, you know, as I was trying to think about the future, it was almost natural that my mind went back to the time I grew up playing games, you know, getting nostalgic. Uh, you know, I probably started playing games in the 80s, started on the Atari playing Pac-Man, I think everybody here has probably played, played that. Um, moved on to, I remember this was also probably in the 80s that I used to go to my grandmother's house in Delhi and would beg, borrow and steal uh, to play Mario Bros. Uh, and then in the 90s, early 90s, late, late 80s, early 90s, I was a proud owner of an Intel 386 on which I could play Prince of Persia, you know. Um, that, was, that was my gaming journey as a, I'd say an adolescent, a teenager. Um, and that's where my mind went back first. And then I started thinking, if I'm gonna talk about gaming experience and what the future looks like, uh, you know, how do I compare the past to the future? Um, and so the first thing that I thought of is, what are gaming experience? Who is a gamer? Uh, what are they experiencing when they play games? And again, you know, the neuroscience that I love kicks in. And really what, what happens when you're playing games is, is dopamine release. Uh, and depending on how good the game developer is in terms of designing reward mechanisms, and, and to be clear, it's actually not reward mechanisms, it's anticipation of rewards that kicks off dopamine in your brain, and dopamine makes us feel good, makes us feel really good. No surprise that, you know, well-designed games, people want to play more and more and more of them. Um, so how have gaming experiences changed for a gamer? It's going to be pretty damn hard to compare in terms of you know, dopamine release uh, that I was experiencing when I was playing Prince of Persia back in the late 80s to what somebody is experiencing today when they're playing Dota uh, or when they're playing GTA. Uh, pretty hard thing to do. Uh, I mean, if you ask me, I, I was feeling pretty damn good playing, playing the games that I played then. I was hooked to those games. Are people today having a better time? I don't know. Um, but what, we, what has changed, um, what has really changed, and this I have personal experience of, is I'm definitely fighting a lot more with my children about them playing games all the time than my parents were fighting with me, you know. And that's, that's primarily, I think, because game consumption per capita, game production per capita, has just grown exponentially. Uh, I just don't think there was that much content back then. And the two main factors, in my view, that have driven this explosion in, in the gaming space, one, uh, you know, no points for guessing, internet, and the second is mobile devices. What the internet and mobile devices did is two things essentially. One, made it super easy for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of game developers across the world, easy and cheap to bring content to players globally. But the second and far more important thing that I believe that these two developments have done is made games a truly social experience. 
it's only now that we're starting to discover the power of what multiplayer gaming experiences can do. And the biology behind this is also, by the way, very, very clear. The amount of dopamine that your brain puts out when you're playing with a friend or when you're playing with a real person is significantly higher than what the amount of dopamine your brain will put out when you're playing with a machine. You know, we definitely enjoy that social interaction a lot more. So when I walk into my 15-year-old son's room when he's playing Fortnite, what I see is very different from what you would see walking into my room when I was 15 playing Prince of Persia. My son has headphones on, a mic. I mean, he obviously has his computer in front of him. He's laughing, he's chatting, strategizing, sometimes screaming, cursing, banging the desk, you know. I mean, it's truly a social experience that he's having when he's playing games. And to me, you know, at least until now, that is the most profound change that has come across as gaming. That's certainly not the experience that I had when I was playing games. So what does the future look like? Um, you know, a lot of exciting things. I think cloud gaming potentially transforms uh, you know, what the landscape of console gaming looks like. I'm certainly no expert at console, so I'm going to stay away from that. Uh, AR, VR, super exciting. Uh, personally, I think a long way to go because one, those devices are still cumbersome, and two, they're still pretty expensive. Uh, and three, to my experience, and I have one of those at home, still not super user friendly. Um, there's still a ways to go in terms of these devices. The thing that I'm most excited about, the thing I think is changing the landscape of gaming as we speak and is not really a thing of the future. In fact, something that's changing profoundly the way our society functions today is machine intelligence. And by the way, I, you know, I don't think there exists any machine today that can navigate the traffic in Bangalore. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen in a long, long time. But there are certainly machines today, and I can tell you that because we're building some of them, we've built some of them, that are able to deliver far superior gaming experiences than what human beings could potentially do. So a little bit about our business. Uh, you know, I'm co-founder, Casey, co-CEO of Games 24-7. Uh, our operating ethos as a business, we describe as the science of gaming. Our foundations, the foundations of our business are based on the principles of science, so not a surprise. We've invested a lot in machine intelligence. Today, machines in our business are optimizing our acquisition campaigns. You know, what's the best space to, place to spend dollars? What's the best creators to spend dollars on? They are optimizing our retention campaigns. They are optimizing our product experiences. And how are they doing that? They're doing that by personalizing. To me, personalization is not just the future of online gaming, not the future of gaming, but it is here now. And if you are a game developer, if you're thinking of developing games, any kind of games, whether in the space that I operate in, which is largely games of skill and some casual gaming, or you're thinking of building AAA games, you're thinking of building casual games, if you're not personalizing experiences for your users, five years max, you're a dinosaur. You don't exist. So what, what is personalization and how can machine intelligence help you personalize experiences? Uh, where can you personalize? My answer to anybody who asks me that question, like whatever your imagination allows you to think of, wherever you can use machine intelligence, use it. So let's take a simple example. Um, and a simple example is let's take any game. Any game could be Candy Crush, could be Dota, could be could be a mid-core game like Clash of Clans, could be a game like Rummy or Fantasy Sports that we run. The first, the first and biggest challenge a game developer has is how do I treat a new user? 
some new users come on your platform that already know how to play the game, some need significant handholding, some need a little bit of handholding, you know, and you can go right across the spectrum from knowing nothing to probably knowing how to start playing as soon as they get into the game. It's not really hard anymore to build machines. And I'm not talking about for people who understand segmenting and clustering, you know, obviously all of that is helpful, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about building machines who are able to look at how a player is behaving in the first few seconds, maybe a minute, minute and a half of their gameplay experience, and can determine from that, just like a live person trying to teach somebody a game would, be, would determine, hey, I think this guy needs more help, so let me explain to him how to go about playing this game. Or you know what, this guy actually knows already all the basic stuff, let me take him ahead faster. That's what machines can allow you to do, and that's where the fun starts. Once you've done that part, now you can get into very interesting things like level design. Some of us might be very good at the game that we're playing, some of us not so good. Some of us have a lot of time, some of us don't. So how do I create the best experience? A, some player, let's say me, who's really struggling, the machine, by looking at how I'm playing the game, how quickly I'm playing, how many mistakes I'm making, you know, can determine, hey, this guy needs a lot of help, let me take him up the level curve slowly, versus some other player who's doing really well, and if I have to keep him engaged on the platform, I need to take him up the level curve far, far more rapidly. Now, this is not something you or I or any individual human being can do at the scale at which games operate. It's just not possible. But we can, we can definitely design intelligent machines that are capable of playing the role, of making those kind of choices for players and delivering awesome game playing experiences for them. That's really the power of, of machine intelligence. And it doesn't stop there. At, at U Games, which is our casual game studio, we've certainly used machines uh, to figure out how to upgrade levels for users. But more than that, we're now able to use machine intelligence to build levels for users, to actually design levels. On our Games 24-7 side of the business where we run our skill gaming platform, we've now built machines which eventually, hopefully, over the course of the next two, three years, will actually make creatives. Not just conceptualize them, but actually make them. Today, these machines for us are advising our designers, our artists, on how to make better creatives based on performance of those creatives when we run them on Facebook or Google and so on and so forth, you know. So, all in all, I would say that if you're looking ahead, if you're imagining what the future of gaming experience looks like, and if you're not thinking personalization, I mean, you're thinking personalization, you're not thinking machine intelligence, you're going to run into serious challenges. That's our view. That's, I mean, this, these are the words that you will hear coming out of every single leadership meeting that we have. Automation and intelligence, automation and intelligence, automate as much as possible, bring as much human intelli machine intelligence into stuff as possible. Um, my view, the future of competition, and this is not just competition between gaming businesses, I mean the future of competition between businesses in general is competition between who can build smarter, faster machines. That's the future. Now, when, when somebody talks about machines so much, you know, some of the people start to worry. Uh, they worry about machines taking over our lives, machines taking over our jobs, machines probably getting intelligent enough to fight with us, or machines, you know, potentially fighting machines. Um, that's, that's the pessimistic view of the world. My view is more along the lines of this. I think machines are going to help us lead better, more productive, more efficient, more fulfilling lives, and probably, and hopefully, <clears throat> maybe even find better versions of ourselves. 
I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much.